Hey everybody, it's Pastor John. Welcome to week number six in our study. You should have read through all six weeks and all, obviously it's, an, it's a cumulative kind of experience and thank you for continuing on being faithful and studying these 10 commandments as we talk about how to live as sons and daughters in God's world. And uh, up to this point, we've, we've recognized each and every part. We are getting the instruction manual on life. Here is the, the, the raw essence of how it works with our relationship with God and with others. And so we continue on in that uh, this week in week six's uh, rendering. Now, we don't always get clear instructions, though. Here, This should be an instruction manual, but we don't always get clear instructions. I found something a while back, and it's sort of a boneheaded list of instructions. These are actual products that are on shelves in stores all around us. And I wanted to share a couple of them with you because we don't always get clear instructions like we hope to find in the Ten Commandments. So here's an actual list of real products that you could buy and how they say to use them, right? Uh, the first one is about a hair dryer. The instructions on the uh, box of the hair dryer says, do not use while sleeping. Okay, fair enough, don't use it while you're sleeping. This is on a bag of Fritos. There's actually a contest going on, and here's what it said on the bag of Fritos. You could be a winner. No purchase necessary. Details inside bag. Yeah, you get the point. Instructions on Tesco's tiramisu dessert. This is a tiramisu dessert. It says, do not turn container upside down. Now, this particular instruction was actually, of course, printed on the bottom of the box, right? Of course. On packaging for a Rowenta brand iron. Rowenta brand iron. It says, do not iron clothes on body. You probably needed to know that, right? That's a good rule, right? Okay, so on Boots brand children's cough medicine. This is Boots brand children's cough medicine. Here's what it says. After using, do not drive car or operate heavy machinery. And the seven-year-old nodded his head and agreed. Okay, he won't. Uh, on a Korean kitchen knife that's available here in American marketplaces is a, a Korean kitchen knife. It says, warning, keep out of children. It's going to catch up with you in a second. Warning, keep out of children. Yes, that's probably wise. It's probably good. Um, if you don't get it, uh, talk to your spouse next to you. Um, also imported into America were strings of Chinese-made Christmas lights. And here are the instructions on these uh, Chinese uh, made Christmas lights for us. Here's what the instructions read. It said for indoor or outdoor use only. For indoor or outdoor use only. Now this last one is, is an instruction I can appreciate. It's on an American Airlines packet of nuts. These, This is I guess maybe back in the day when they used to give out nuts on airplanes. And here's what it said in the instructions. It said open packet, eat nuts. That's good. Simple. Maybe a little no-duh, but simple. I appreciate that. These instructions, though, uh, that we just read, for the most part, are pretty boneheaded. But they still take into account that many of us don't do so well when the manufacturer assumes that we'll get it and doesn't give us any kind of basic uh, idea of how to use their product. Humans need direction, and we really need clear direction. We get frustrated in vagaries. We get frustrated in confusions. We don't seem to do well with ambiguities. And this is the exact need that God gives us, the Ten Commandments, on how life in his kingdom, uh, in, in relationship to him and then relationship to others, we wanted to be really clear and simple in that. And that's how we get the Ten Commandments, because we need those kind of things. He knows something key about us. He's our creator. Uh, he's our rescuer, we found. Uh, right? But he's our creator, and he knows that we are not uh, designed to succeed in moral ambiguity. We don't succeed well in moral ambiguity, nor do we function well with others in moral ambiguity. It gets really sticky, it gets a little strange uh, when we don't know what we're supposed to be and do. Uh, and so this is where we're at in the Ten Commandments. Thought I'd have a little bit of fun with you, but also just to remind us what we're doing here. Why, are we ha why do we have this in our hands? Uh, God gives us a vision, an idea, and a direction on how to live inside of a kingdom. Here's where we're at so far in the Ten Sayings. Saying number one, God is powerfully rescuing me, and he is powerfully rescuing us, right? Uh, commandment number two, nothing before God and God before everything. Commandment number three, reverence for God in my heart lives in my words. Commandment number four, rest and right yourself with God and family weekly. 
Uh, saying number five, honor the weight of your parents' responsibility to God and be an honorable parent. Commandment number six, every person's life equally is valued at God's own life. Commandment number seven, sexual purity protects our love and it opens up creation's greatest pleasures to us and for us. And then we began the reading, although tonight we will not cover uh, this in the conversation, but uh, commandment number nine is this, champion everyone's true identity, integrity, and reputation. Champion everyone's true identity, integrity, and reputation. The next time we talk, we are going to spend our time there uh, together. Uh, and that right there is what we're making our way now into our word section for the night. And I want to read something to you. Uh, we actually covered a little of this the last uh, time or two in our conversations, but I want to give it, it goes into a brand new context now. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. It says that God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Adam and Eve, man and woman, male and female, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Now, uh, if you actually encounter in the Torah, uh, generally and specifically in this front section of the book of Genesis, uh, you realize that there's a couple different uh, moments that get pulled in and out. It's not chronological. And so you actually come to chapter 2 and you find a conversation that's happening before he gives these instructions uh, to male and female, to Adam and to Eve. So if you have a Bible there, again, open on your lap. Turn to chapter 2, verse 18. Here we find something a little bit a prequel to what command he just gave them to multiply, to be fruitful and multiply. It says in chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. At this point, he had just simply made Adam, uh, the first man. He said, I'll make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the, uh, the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. He takes note of this. God parades all these animals. There's a male and there's a female, uh, and he gives them all names, and he recognizes, wait, there's two of them, there's only one of me. Uh, verse uh, 21 of chapter 2. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while the man slept, the Lord God took out of one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed. <laughs> he's, he's been waiting. So here, it, it seems like it goes in a real flash to us, but there must be a, a, just a process here that's happened. He's named all the animals of creation that God has paraded in front of them, and he just says, ah, here, here we go. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. Verse 24 says, This explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. The seventh saying, uh, the seventh commandment, can't be fully understand, understood as a command apart from hearing its context from which it comes. It, the Torah is one larger story, right? It's one big story. And Exodus is simply the second book in that series of five books. And so uh, you would not have read to this point if you were, if you understood it, you, you never would read the book of Exodus by itself. The Torah was, was, a, was a pack. And so in that way, God would not give a thou shalt not, like we see here in, in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. You would not see a thou shalt not without having understood the thou shalt part of it. It was in Genesis chapter one and two. Uh, the fact is, this is one of the very first things, uh, institutional uh, uh, creation. It is a relational uh, creation. It is something about heaven that he is, he is showing us as well and the relationship that, that we have uh, with him and with one another. He's showing us the creation and he, he explains all these things from uh, inside the creation marriage and sexual union. He says to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. 
The two are united into one. The man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Okay, this uh, ushers us into our second section, stirred. We had the word section. What does the scripture say? And now there's a stirred section. What are we supposed to do? How does this land? What's this look like? Here's the Sunday part of it. Here's the Monday part of it. How do we find ourselves getting stirred? Well, we just read these verses, of course. It says that the two were united into one. They become one flesh. The man and his wife were, were both naked and they felt no shame. There is clearly a, uh, a sexual, a very physical, and of course, an emotional connection that happens here because those are foundational. They're fundamental to a marriage covenant. And they're the only thing that we can't share with somebody else. Think of this. This is uh, intimacy and it is sacred. It's sacred on a couple different levels. It is sacred because sex uh, is an, an issue of purity with God because you can only have a, a, a sexual relationship and an emotional relationship um, in a covenantal way. This is how God designs it, how he's describing it. It's only available to two. Now, is this how we get the messaging in the wider world that we live in? That marriage um, is where you should, you can and can only uh, experience sexual intimacy? Uh, that it's only between a man and a woman, a male and a female? No, this is not the messaging at all that we have surrounding us, but this is what scripture says. It's actually uh, very, it's a touchy, touchy reality uh, to talk about biblical marriage, biblical sexual intimacy, and it's clearly described here in Scripture. Now, it's not the message that we see in the wider world, but secondly, does the fact that sexual intimacy is designed by God not only to be between a man and a woman, but particularly a man and a woman in covenant, does that make sexual purity easier? No, of course not. Not unless you're a hundred. Right? It doesn't, because God made it that way, it doesn't mean that it's easy to fulfill in our lives, even if we're married. Because uh, if, if you're 99 years old or younger, sexual appetite, sexual temptation, they are incredibly real. And that's why Jesus talks about it. He knows how we're made, He knows the temptations that we face, He knows that there is something, an urge in us, there is a, a, a hunger. A desire that is that is physical, that's certainly emotional, that's spiritual, that wants to have a deep connection with another person. And often it looks like us trying to, uh, in, in the wider world, it's them just acting out in sexual ways. But the, the sexual plan that God has for us is made for covenant. And so this is why Jesus speaks about this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, which you're very welcome to open up to. It says, You have heard the commandment that says, You must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. You have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written uh, notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has become unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Uh, which brings us back to that commandment, doesn't it? Uh, the commandment we found in, in Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5, thou shalt not commit adultery. The corridor, though, the corridor to adultery is something, however, that we enter a long, long time before anything ever becomes physical with another person. This is what Jesus is getting at. Uh, that adultery and the pathway into it, the, the pipeline into that, is not simply just that we had physical sex with a person of the other gender, even though that's, I guess, the, the strict basic rule of it. The corridor to adultery is in our thought life. It's in our emotions. So our temptations uh, to, to, to stray from this take that shape too. It, it's in our thought life, how we see the world, how we see other people, how men begin to look at women as objects because that's how they've been watching movies and shows and pictures and magazines and things on the internet. That's how we take it on. Uh, for women, the temptation to uh, seek emotional connection with somebody else. These are the things that we read about, that we see, that we fantasize about. And so the temptations in our life are customized to us. So this is the fact that our God is, he knows that these are the temptations and he's very aware uh, that, uh, that this is going on in us and he has a stronger defense than the temptation 
or the power of Satan to bring temptation to us. And here's how he says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Perhaps you were reading this in your own readings uh, over the course of the study. He says, whoever thinks he stands, be careful not to fall. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. There will be a way out. God is stronger than the temptation. He is certainly stronger than Satan and any of the darkness that might bring temptation our way. He is stronger than, than that. He knows it's a part of our strengthening of our character to say no to temptation and say yes to righteousness. And so he'll make a way out. One of the most famous, probably the most famous story that illustrates this, uh, this passage is in the Old Testament, a, a gentleman named Joseph. Joseph of the Old Testament, he's one of our patriarchs. And Joseph found himself uh, as a household slave in the house of a, a powerful man in Egypt, a guy named Potiphar. He was a powerful person in government, um, and Joseph was uh, through uh, a number of precarious, uh, a series of stories that got him into a situation. Well, he is a slave, although one that was advancing in the house of this man called Potiphar. And Potiphar was kind of infam infamous for not being around the house uh, a lot. He was tending to the affairs of state, and uh, something is worth noting in that alone, you know. How does Joseph find himself into this situation where his wife, uh, Potiphar's wife, is going to hit on him and try to lull him into adultery? The fact is, is that Potiphar has a part in this thing, not just Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's nowhere to be found. He's busy working. Is he a workaholic? It doesn't matter. He's just not around. And, and Potiphar's wife grows hungry. Uh, for something that she is not finding in him. He's not around physically. Uh, he's not around apparently sexually enough. Um, he is not around emotionally. And so she's starting to look elsewhere. Uh, and that's what happens when we deprive ourselves of our wife's presence, guys, our connection, our intimacy, and of course, sex. And that's true for both sides of the genders. So Potiphar's rarely around at home and his wife gets to noticing their Hebrew slave, this guy named Joseph. Several times, Genesis will tell us that she came on to him. She loosely wears her, her clothes to draw his eyes. She throws herself at him from time to time. She calls into the bedroom. She is doing everything she can. And up to this point, Joseph finds a way to avoid it. Well, here's the one time it got just too serious to, to be able to just uh, pass it off uh, because Joseph's in a really difficult circumstance here. Genesis chapter 39 uh, verse 5, it tells the story. Uh, From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All of Potiphar's household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and his livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food he'd eat. So Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. She said, come and sleep with me, she demanded, but Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Verse 10 says, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. And she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. And when she saw that she was holding his cloak uh, and he had fled, she called out to her servants. So maybe they're outside the buildings, outside the house. She calls out to those servants and soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak with me. So Joseph is seeing, I mean, just time after time after time, he's between a rock and a hard place here, right? But he, he, he this time he, he has no other alternative, but his escape, like every, almost 99.9% .9 of every temptation, the way of escape is to say no and to run away run away from it. That's a part of the character. There, there's, no, uh, there's no other virtue other than just say, no, and I've got to get out of here. And this is what Joseph does. In the short term, the lies of Potiphar's loose wife punish Joseph because he'd end, end up going to prison. You know, Potiphar gets home. She tells him this lie. Potiphar believes her. 
and he sends Joseph off to prison. But prison's never worse than a cage of guilt, right? Uh, gentlemen and ladies, the, like Joseph would have felt had he slept with this seductive wife of Potiphar's. The pleasure would have been immediate, and it would have probably been great, but it would have been short, and the guilt and the shame incredibly long. It, it would, there would be zero payoff here, zero payoff other than the immediate pleasure. And so here it maybe is a group conversation starter, uh, and, and you might want to consider breaking into groups of men and women. If you choose to answer this, group leaders, you know what you'd like to walk out tonight, but you might want to consider breaking into groups of men and women uh, because this could be a delicate conversation. Here are some questions. What forms do your temptations to defy this direction, this guideline of sexual integrity and intimacy and marriage, what forms do they take? What does that look like? Where are you encountering temptation? Um, uh, you know, some obvious places, guys, the internet, you know, um, um, ladies, you can speak to this. What word do the forms take on? Is it conversations with uh, somebody at work or uh, whatever it might be? Talk about what those forms look like because they're going to be pretty common, uh, I think, among you. And then two, what are the conditions of life that you most feel temptation to lust or betray or push boundaries? What are the conditions of life? How are you feeling? What are you going through in those times when Satan chooses to come and attack you at that time? Is there something that might be true of you and maybe even true uh, of the ones you're talking to? But you can choose if these are great questions for you or not, uh, but I would really encourage you to break up with men and women separate uh, so they can speak a little bit more freely and a little more commonly. So, hey, thank you so much. This is really heavy stuff. We pray for your marriage to be whole. And temptations are coming. There's no doubt about it. Satan hates you. The darkness hates you. Um, our, our, our bodies sometimes feel like they're fighting against uh, trying to live inside the kingdom of God. But we are for you. We pray for you. And I pray for your marriage to be happy and whole and, um, and holy. So, Heavenly Father, today I pray that you bless this conversation with the, uh, this, uh, with the groups as they encounter these, uh, these questions, these directions, Lord. Uh, Lord, the, the guideline's clear. Don't commit adultery. But Lord, how to do this in every different way, uh, it's hard. And so I pray, God, that you give guidance, uh, support, and blessing, Lord, to each person, that your spirit would give us, Lord, uh, strength in the midst of temptation. Help us to make right decisions, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Blessings, everybody. We'll see you next week.